Yep, I'm going to be talking about understanding Rx Swift using Rx tests. I'm going to do it again, I'm afraid. I was looking down, so I wasn't counting. Uh, hands up, who's heard of Rx Swift or Reactive Coco? Awesome. Wow. Uh, how many of you have tried it out, played with it a little bit? How many of you are using it day to day? Less. And how many of you are testing it? Oh, <laughs> bold souls, round of applause. Um, I'm hoping that everyone will be able to take something from this talk. If you haven't tried it or have only just played around with it a bit, hopefully it'll give you some insight into how you can understand it a bit better. If you're already using it, maybe you can learn how to test it and add some tests to make your code a bit more bulletproof. And finally, if you're already a total pro, uh, you might be able to find a new way to explain it to people. I know when I started learning it, the explanations I found were really confusing. So maybe this will simplify things. Okay, so what is it at first? Although everyone's already heard of it, so you already know this. Um, there's various definitions out there on the internet. I've listed some of them there. Uh, the one at the bottom is the one that I made up about two days ago, uh, which made the most sense to me. Uh, it's about communicating data through your app using streams, and it gives you a tool set uh, to combine, create, and filter those streams. We're going to come back to this idea, so don't worry if it doesn't quite make sense yet. Why would you use it? That's another very good question. Well, the first one is to avoid something called callback hell. Uh, if you've done web development and JavaScript programming, you'd be familiar with the pyramid of doom. Uh, callback hell is not this. Uh, it looks a little bit more like this. Uh, it can often be with API calls or dependencies. If you have a series of events that need to happen dependent on something else, sometimes you can quite often end nesting it like this. Rx Swift helps you get around that problem. At Novoda, where I work, uh, we also use it a lot because of the cross-platform understanding now. The Rx paradigm has been translated into lots of different languages, including Rx Java. We found by using it in different apps and on the web as well, you can have a shared understanding with other programmers as to how you structure your apps. There's some misconceptions about it as well. And I confess I fell for quite a lot of these. Um, I first thought that you had to be a functional programming wizard to use it. I genuinely sat down, downloaded the How to Haskell book, thinking that I couldn't possibly understand this thing without really knowing it. Turns out, you don't. I still don't know Haskell. Um, it can also sometimes feel like all or nothing, uh, like you have to implement an entire rewrite of your code to make use of it. And again, that's not true. You can use it in a small part of your app. You may use it for, like I said, the API calls or for the interface and, and how you translate user actions on the interface to changes in your code. One other misconception is it will fix everything. Uh, that once you've done Rx, your code will be beautiful and bulletproof. Uh, no, it's just like any other code. You can write it well and you can write it badly. Testing can help you maybe write it a bit better. It can help you break things down. And there's one other reason which we can't really discount that the cool kids are using it. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. Sometimes if a lot of very smart people that you admire are using it, it might be worth giving it a try. So the second question is, why would you use tests to understand it? I know a lot of people approach testing as something that you add in to the end of your app, maybe before you hand it over to QA, because you probably think you should. Um, testing can be a really powerful tool to learning and to understanding. It can make something abstract, concrete, and again, something like Rx, where a lot of things sort of happen in the background, can feel really strange because you can't see it in the way you're used to with object-oriented programming. It's also the scientific method. With testing, you have to state your expectations, run an experiment to see how they work, and then look at the results and compare it to your original expectation. It can really help with understanding. Also, play. I don't know about you, but when I'm learning something for the first time, I quite like to break it. Um, it's one of the advantages we have being programmers. If you do that as an architect, if you build a house and experiment with the doors, it can go horribly wrong and be quite expensive. Uh, with coding, when you're learning, you can just say, well, I wonder what happens if I put a string through this observable instead of an int. And you can look at it and see how it changes. And finally, reassurance when you're doing that playing or maybe even shipping an app. Um, having tests can reassure you that what the changes you're making won't break everything. And I definitely found this because I joined a project which was already very heavily using Rx Swift, but didn't have tests at the time. And so I was terrified to touch that code because I couldn't see what it was doing and I couldn't test it or I didn't know how to test it at the time. So I didn't know if what I was doing was going to break it. 
So yeah, hopefully I've persuaded you that tests can be really powerful. And this was where I was about four months ago, not knowing any RX Swift. So I wanted to test it, but I couldn't find documentation about how to do it. I couldn't find simple examples that made sense to a beginner. So I suppose I'm standing here to try and make up for that. <laughs> so hopefully by the end of this talk, you have go away with a simple idea, a very simple example of, of how you can use RX tests. So how? <laughs> so I'm going to walk through a quick demo. It's very simple. It's very trivial. You'll if you're new to it, you might look at it and go, well, that's stupid and easy. I'm never going to use that. But it will give you a template to understand how to go away and apply it to slightly more complicated ones. Uh, it labors a bit of a metaphor, so please do bear with me. So we've got a tractor, and it's going through a field. And as this tractor goes through the field, it encounters a stream of different events. Some of these are corn, which it wants to take and, and store. Uh, and some of it are various creepy crawlies that you probably don't want to end up in your bread. Uh, so we've been given the task of, as this tractor goes around, it's going to encounter the events. We've given the task to filter out events that aren't corn, aren't delicious and yummy. So how are we going to do this? We're going to use Rx, because Rx deals well with events as they come through. So the first concept I spoke about before is streams, and they really underpin Rx. Stream sends stuff. It's not complicated. It's like an array. An array can hold stuff, just as the same streams hold stuff. The difference is they hold stuff as they come through. So if you subscribe to that stream, you will be able to observe those events. If you're not subscribed to that stream and those events happen, they're gone for good. They're not sticking around. OK, and an observable is just a fancy name for a stream. Um, I'm going to use the two interchangeably, and I would encourage you to as well. Stream is a lot more visual. It makes a bit more sense. Observable is what you actually write in your code. <laughs> and this is another visualization. So we're, here is our tractor. It's going around collecting streams, and we have a barn stream. And that stream is going to receive the corn as it comes through. We're going to do that with a struct. It's going to be a, called a corn sorter, and it is going to filter out anything that is not corn. And here's the first bit of code. So we have a struct, hopefully a familiar object for those of you who write Swift. Uh, the struct is initialized with that tractor stream, the stream of events coming from the tractor. And then it exposes, it has a property, which is the barn stream. You can see here in the syntax, it's an observable, and it's an observable of type string. We're familiar with Swift type safety. Observables, the same as arrays, you declare what type you expect to receive through them. And then here we have some, uh, some gaps where we're first going to write our test and then we're going to make it pass. OK, on to some more code. Uh, anyone who's written tests, this is a familiar start, hopefully. Um, you need to import both Rx Swift and Rx tests into your test case. Uh, if you don't, you'll get some errors because Rx tests gives you some additional objects which help you test your code. OK, next. So we're going to start our test. And here we introduce the first extra helper bits that Rx test gives us. We have our test scheduler there and our test observer. And just a reminder, streams send stuff at specific time. Unless you're subscribed to that screen when the event comes through, you will miss it. And this is what they do. So our test scheduler helps us send through events at time. So imagine if we just started with a with a big dump of things at once, that wouldn't be testing how Rx works because Rx sends things through at a particular time. So in this example, we have a test scheduler. It's sending through objects. And our test subject, in this case, something that makes things color colorful, is sending out a stream of those objects which have now been made colorful. We then have our testable observer. This is the second part we need in order to test Rx. The testable observer notes down everything that goes through that observer that you're looking at. So it notes through events, it notes through the time the events happen as well, and also when your stream completes. This gives us what we can then compare our expectations to. So when we're testing it, we put in a set of test inputs, and then we compare that to the outputs that we get. OK, so we've written our code. So we can see our test scheduler is starting at an initial clock of 0. That is the concept of test time. So in Rx tests, the time that things happen at is fake. It just happens at time one, time two, time three, time four. 
This is great because it means our tests don't have to do real time. So if you're testing that your stream can receive data over 20 minutes, you don't have to wait 20 minutes for your test to run. Here, we've declared our test input. That's an array because it's the easiest way. And then we, we turn that array into a stream of uh, observable stream of events. That stream of events is then passed on to our test scheduler, which is going to spit out those events one by one over the test time. We then create our corn sorter, which is our subject under test. And in that input, we put in, <laughs> we create the corn sorter with the test data that we've just declared, or the observable of the test data. Okay, next we subscribe our test observer, that's the SPI, to the corn sorter's barn stream. That's the result of the operation that we're doing. You'll also notice there's the dispose bag there. Anyone who's not familiar with Rx, uh, it might seem a bit odd. It's specific to Rx Swift. Other languages don't use it. It's a way of cleaning up after yourself. It means you don't leave litter lying around, as it were. Uh, we then start our scheduler. Finally, we declare the expected events. These are the order in which we expect things to happen and the time at which we expect them to come through. Uh, the test time, it's not like an array. It's not doesn't start at zero. So at time zero, that's when our scheduler starts. That's when the stream opens. And then the first event happens at one. And then we complete it. And then we simply assert that those two things are the same. And that's it. That's all there is to testing with Rx Swift. Um, we then, obviously, at the moment, our tests are failing. So we just need to make those tests pass. We simply filter out anything that's not corn. And that's, that's the example. It seems, I hope, quite simple. Um, I know until I learned it, I thought it'd be terrifying. <laughs> um, uh, I've got some more resources here. Um, hopefully, the demo has piqued your interest in testing. Now, I know most code that we write every day has a distinct lack of cute emoji mice and little caterpillars being run over by tractors. Uh, but there really are plenty of real life uses for Rx. Uh, this example here is taken from a talk which I've got a link to um, by Ash Furrow, where he, dis he explains how to create a login screen. Uh, the login screen, the login button will only be activated once the two fields are filled out. Um, and he shows how you can do that much more nicely with Rx Swift. But he doesn't show how to test it, which you will now know how to do. And I can't wait to see how you do it. Uh, so, yep, yeah, uh, here's a list of resources as to how to get started. Um, there is also, um, if you want to see some examples of, I'll, I'll send the links around on the Meetup page as well. Um, uh, here we've got a demo app that Navoda put together. It was, it's a demo of Firebase, which is a technology you don't have to know much about to look at the demo. Um, but it does have examples of real life using Rx tests in actual code that actually works, um, not just tractors and mice. Um, so yeah. Uh, any questions? Thank you very much. Right, first question. So in your example, you were filtering out corn from the rest. Uh, in like a real life example, what are you filtering out? Uh, so say in the example that we did here. Oh. Yep, uh, in this case, we wouldn't be filtering. What we'd be doing is passing in events. So in this case, I might want to test that if I've passed in five values into the username, say Swift London, and then into the password, and then I test that at that point, the login button was still disabled. And then through the, I pass through a stream of the password field, for example, and then would test at what points in that flow the login button was enabled and disabled and check that it was only enabled once all the fields were completed. And then maybe what happens if I delete a couple of characters and my password has to be eight characters at least. But the filtering itself is not specific to Rx. It's a function you may be used to using elsewhere in Swift. Um, the filtering in that case is just, yeah. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. So when you're testing this, you're testing a stream over time. Um, which may not be quick, may not be slow. Does that add any time to testing? I mean, does your test observer just sort of ignore the real-time effect and just send it really quickly? 
Uh, yes, yeah, so for RX tests, at least with the test time, you're mainly testing the order in which events come through rather than the, the speed at which they come through. So, yeah. yeah. I so, I uh, believe you, there is RX blocking as well. Um, that may give you more control over testing that it stays alive for 10 minutes or sort of more of the, the time aspect of it. I'm just wondering, how would you test? Maybe this is just a contrived example, but you've got two asynchronous events happening at the same time. Mm -hmm. You need to make sure they're both done. Now, in using straight Swift or Cocoa, I know how I do that. I just have operations in the completion queue. How would you do that with something like something that's observing events all the time and you never know when they're finished? Um, if, I, if I understand your question correctly, uh, I would probably test with my knowledge. Remember, I've only been doing this for four months, so this is, this is quite new. But um, I would probably test the different cases. So I would test what happens if event A comes before event B, event B comes before event C, the other way around, and just test that whichever order those things arrived in, I was dealing with it. Yeah, so the question is, RX, um, RX test allows you to specify that sort of timing as well? Yeah, okay. so as long as you're using, so if you've got two asynchronous events coming through two streams, as long as you're using the same test scheduler, right. you can schedule those. In the example I gave there, I just converted an array straight to an observable, and then it came out one, two, three, four, five. You can also specify at which point you want an event to come through, so you could, as long as you're using the same scheduler, they're happening along the same timeline and you can control at which point in the timeline those things happen. So the, so the trick is to use the same scheduler then yeah. to watch it. Okay, thank you. Um, that was, yeah, great talk, thank you. Um, I'm just getting used to using RX Swift and enjoying it, the convenience and getting rid of overuse of delegates and notifications and so forth. Um, but I still feel I have to look up documentation to to get my head around certain operators um, as I go. Is there any um, point of reference you use uh, regularly to, uh, to, to remind yourself of, of um, just how to, to get used to RX Swift so you can change your, your mindset from normal iOS? Yeah, I've been finding a mix of things. Uh, like I said, I started on a project which already had it in, so I did use quite a lot of looking back and seeing how we'd done it elsewhere. Um, the RX Swift repo on GitHub the, some areas are very well documented, some are less so. Uh, sometimes you have to dig into the example code um, to get a really good idea of it. Um, as well, just had a look. So uh, this point, the, the testing your RX Swift code by Marin, I can't pronounce the surname. Um, he has a really good blog where he's covered um, different areas of it with code examples. And that blog was where I first, I found the only example I found of, of RX tests actually implemented. So yeah, that was, that was generally where I look. Oh, one more thing to note, they do have a, a Slack channel as well, which I have heard is really helpful. So um, do get in there and actually just ask them. They're really good. More questions? Oh, that, uh, phenomenally good talk. It was great. <laughs> uh, I was just wondering how you're feeling about the Swift 3 changes and how that kind of plays into like the functional future or lack of future in Swift. I think it should be interesting. I think Swift is a flexible enough language that if you want to take it in that direction, you should be able to. And, and again, the community seems to have sprung up to really ensure that. Um, I've been impressed at the speed. I think RX Swift has got the, the Swift free branch out. As for the functional programming, I'm really starting to dig into it. And I think it has a great future. And I hope Swift free will encourage that. But I haven't yet had the chance to really play around with it and, and see how that goes. Well, cheers, Yvette. That was Thank fantastic. So, round of applause.